Hello guys, Fcast, a football podcast. Uh, we finally are here with our very first episode. As for quite some time, it was coming. I will quickly introduce myself. Uh, I am Ayuk, and with me I've got Orko. Hello guys. Hello. So just to give uh, you all a brief overview, uh, what is coming in this podcast is basically we will be discussing and refreshing ourselves with some of the greatest football moments. I think it's time for us to dive into football nostalgia. We will reload, relieve, and rejuvenate ourselves, walking down the memory lane of this beautiful game. So, Orko, what do you? In case you want to add something. Yeah, hello guys. This is an initiative by us. This is everything about football that we see, that we do, and that we feel about this beautiful game. This is about commoners like us. who are basically football fan boys since childhood or at a time of their life when they understood the importance of football in their lives and uh, we will take you through this journey of ours in which we shall discuss uh, a lot about football so let's get started mayuk absolutely so, so who goes for football first you or me uh, let me strike first so mayuk What was the moment that you fell in love with football? Well, well, well that's a very interesting thing. Even that is a question. Even I ask him to be a football fan because uh, this is a question. I think everybody has a story to tell, and that story is quite different and very intriguing, exactly. which I feel. So exactly. uh, my story uh, goes back uh, in the year probably uh, during 1998. So the month was uh, late May, early June. Suddenly, uh, because. We were going up in streets of Bogota. So suddenly, I saw uh, the Brazilian flags and Argentinian flags and uh, Italian flags and other countries' flags flying all around. Suddenly, yeah, the political, uh, political yeah, and the flags were suddenly replaced with national flags. So that is very fascinating. So uh, I, I was a guy of standard fourth by uh, that time. So I asked my um, household and friends, "What exactly is going on?" Obviously, my friends had no clue because they were of the same age. So what I was told by my uncle that something called the football World Cup is just round the corner. So that is when the first. Uh, sorry. That's a very tender age to know about football. Absolutely, because so, I, I had some memories of '96 Cricket World Cup because I, I I didn't understand cricket also by then, but I had the image of Vinod Kambli crying, and that's what I <laughs> related Cricket World Cup to. So by, by at that age, so suddenly I uh, thought, "Are in football also there is World Cup?" Okay, fine. And then suddenly, uh, just a few days before the start of World Cup, there was a huge uproar in the media because I used to follow the newspaper then. I used to read uh, newspaper uh, only the sports page uh, those times. So suddenly there was a news that Romario has been uh, excluded from the Brazilian squad, and there was a huge roar. Everybody was talking about it. The media was talking. The commoners were talking, and everybody was cursing the Brazilian coach for that. So that's when I, uh, I, I think Mario Jagalo was the coach of Brazil. If I am not wrong, um, I might be mistaken. Nineteen ninety-eight World. And, uh, and and Romari excluded, and then then all these was just uh, um, getting me more and more into the game. But somehow I didn't have a clue of it. What is football and what it is like? And then uh, then actually the '98 World Cup started, and Brazil was doing very well uh, that time. Netherlands was doing very well. There was a couple of teams, and some of the teams were expected to do well were not doing. And these were all which I heard people discussing about. It. Because I and I only the fact that the ball was going near the penalty box of a team that was uh, making me go. I was just fascinated by the fact, and I was every time the ball went near the penalty box, I used to see whether it is goal or not. So that was the first excitement I saw. I'm having having about this game. So then, yeah, so the 1998 World Cup took place. Uh, it just uh, continued, and then the final happened. I don't know what happened to me. The, my whole area, whole colony, everybody was supporting Brazil, but I somehow wanted France to win. And the moment Zidane was scoring the headers, I saw every house were after one house after other was just shutting down their lights. So 
i understood the emotion what emotions uh jitra run into the game i also started our country doesn't play our country is not nowhere near the frame uh, of uh, yeah, into playing world cup but somehow i see we are running so high on emotion so what would be the con- the original country supporters or the parent country supporters or the players who are going uh, what emotions must be the players players going through so that is when i started venturing into football and then uh, after the world cup ended the 98 99 season the uh, unexpected unfolded the manchester united happened just the trouble the historic trouble <laughs> I, i think that is when i started loving the game and i said yeah this is it so this is it. so my basic idea of football revolves around this event so and and uh, honestly i would like to know about you also so what what made you fall yeah, for the just game? to book, just to add to your whole experience that we in calcutta we have this i refer to this as calcutta's because our childhood days was as Cal- calcutta's and yes. uh, this is culture of yeah exactly this culture of being a fanboy especially of the latin american countries i mean because of the flair football that we probably relate to from our maidan that makes what uh, that that's what makes uh, the whole football world cup this and not just an event but a celebration of football throughout calcutta and west bengal too so yeah, yeah. place in the world, world where the post is worshiped still on the day of bengali new year uh, that is 14th or 15th april depending among the year i think the post is worshiped we call it the bar pujo bar pujo every club that, yeah and only only yeah. thing that keeps the bar pujo from happening is corona because it never stopped only yeah, it was stopped <laughs> exactly exactly uh coming so, back to your question I, I, yeah yeah i would like to know about your story as well because more or less we started we started watching uh, during the same times i guess exactly 98 world cup was probably the first world cup that i saw in my senses and uh, yes. but the love affair began uh four years back it was usa 94 and okay. it was the divine ponytail of roberto baggio missing the penalty and uh-huh. just like you uh being a supporter of france because everyone else supported brazil it was a yeah. similar scenario uh, brazil was the informed team they were the team with the flair the jogo bonito style of football romario whom you said missed out on the next world cup but he was the top scorer of the last world cup jointly with baggio and uh, he was a figure worshipped in back in brazil he is probably he also claims to have scored a thousand goals too uh, most of which are i mean most of which are in official foot fifa matches but some of which are also in unofficial matches and it, it was that game which made me fall for f- football as a whole because it was a game of hope and despair like everyone probably everyone around me was a world to me back then when i was 4 years of age and everyone was supporting brazil and i felt pity on italy first because they were defending with their teeth on the ground and everyone knows about italian defense and that's what the way they passionately defended their goal that made me fall for them and the rest is i have always been an italian supporter throughout but i loved and enjoyed the game of football mostly next question mayuk okay, okay absolutely this I, i will go for it so uh, also this is a, a very common question i uh, you must have answered this many often because this is a very common question even who are not football fans ask you so this is a very uh, cliche question so uh, please tell me the name of your favorite club and why and at, uh, what were the incidents when you started uh, supporting that club well club allegiance i have it with uh, ac milan oh. just because i was a italian fan and uh, it was italian serie as glory days and yeah. i grew up watching the red i mean maroon and gold of milan 
and in that most and derby the... was milan derby was something else those days we used to just uh, stay uh, late at night just to watch the milan derby exactly and probably uh, that image of uh, matrazi standing with his ha- hands on his hips and uh, rui costa of milan standing with his uh, elbows on matrazi's uh, shoulders watching the whole stadium i mean san siro the stand of san siro burn in yeah, red flares yeah exactly that was some story back then Champions League semi final quarter final or semi final it was uh, and uh, ultimately ac milan managed to just beat inter milan and enter the final if if i am not mistaken maybe the, uh, the it was the champions league semi final or uh, you're talking about yeah those days italian clubs dominated like spanish clubs would uh, yeah. today even juventus was saying, not far behind juventus also had a quality of reach legacy of players yeah it was an all it uh, like uh, last year's final between uh, liverpool and tottenham uh, i remember it was the final of 2004 probably when it was an all italian final between juventus and milan yeah yeah exactly and ac milan we all hope ac milan uh, returns to shape uh, sooner than later because because that could be a big benefit to world football milan had given so many things has added so much legacy to world football and has provided so many players not just when players they, but, but uh, also the coaches that have that have come up through the ranks and become world figures like carlo ancelotti uh, roberto mancini to name a few even conte conte is a byproduct of uh, a different generation of italian football okay so just because you said uh, you are a fan of ac milan I want to ask you this question what uh, how much importance does maldini holds in your life because maldini was always associated because we knew maldini was the symbol of loyalty and he was uh, he played for ac milan for 22 years if i am not wrong from 86 to uh, 2008 and his dad uh, his dad played for ac milan now his son is playing for ac milan so an entire family of milanites his generations all of whom has suffered from corona and all of yeah. whom have yeah. for milan yeah so so that is that is a, a fact because uh, i came to, because uh, i came to know about these different clubs through different different players so for ac milan when i came to know was when i was in standard 5th or 6th it's because of paolo maldini because i i i was a huge fan of paolo maldini though i was not an italian fan ever i don't support italy because i don't like their defensive style of play oh, but, yeah. so, that, but, that uh, was an yeah. era in which uh, like like greek gods italian gods played football i mean Absolutely. that was a difference that you could trust with your eyes closed and these were players who just didn't play for the for money they probably played for the shirt they wore and they yeah. probably worshiped the shirt they wore is yeah. for pride is for pride is somebody something which was redefined by italy exactly and i will t- tell you a story about this uh, once you must be knowing the story and this is very well uh, i mean i mean everyone knows about it probably and uh, this was a story about sir alex ferguson meeting uh, cesar maldini paolo maldini's dad yeah i know uh, who, who was a manager of uh, milan back then and they had a chat in 98 football world cup exactly but in the meantime he was a, for a brief period he was a manager of ac milan and he, alex ferguson asked enquired about the tra- possibility of a transfer of his son to manchester united and the only reply that cesar maldini gave was smile at him and oh. that's not happening <laughs> yeah. so that that was the loyalty of a family towards a club that's absolutely. that's the beauty of the game uh, i yeah. must say absolutely so we have seen such loyalties in uh, for uh, people playing for mohan bagan as well 
but but something family loyalty is something which is very unique uh, in today's world because you can have somebody who is, some one player who is loyal but an entire generation or entire hierarchy of their family who are following the same club is something very very unique, unique. absolutely and, and these very are the people who football football uh, the beautiful game honestly precisely and what about your favorite club my you already mentioned it i guess yeah absolutely so as i told you after the 90, uh, 98 world cup still i didn't understand football that well but i used to sit with my uncle who uh, probably is um, is not there now so uh, we used to watch and he used to teach me all the basics of football like uh, what is offside what is off the ball run what is man marking what is zonal marking and he used to be a journalist uh, back then uh and then he uh, with him i started was uh, following the english premier league uh, because that was called english premier league then now it uh, it is called barclays premier league and uh, the only reason is uh, la ligas and italian serie a's were not so uh, were not so convenient as per timings uh, as much as uh, premier league was because uh, they used to come late at night and um, moreover premier league uh, all the matches was telecast but the for premier leagues uh, for la ligas and bundesliga and uh, italian series only the top uh, matches were telecast if i correct it wrong few selected matches would be telecast so exactly from milan and juventus and and, and therefore barcelona and madrid and that also used to come late at night for as of now it has become very convenient for uh, as per indian timings because they have seen india as a potential market but uh, exactly both days it was not the key. whole yeah so we, what i used to happen is we used to study uh, in the in the weekends uh, i used to study in the morning and from uh, weekends uh, see, after evening after four one match is to start at 5 5:30 then another match at 7 7:30 uh, then another match at uh, around 9 another match at 11 so there were four slots and i used to match uh, watch each of them and that time at that point of time 98 99 season rest of england and rest of europe for that because uh, they probably won every damn thing they played uh, and and the trouble happened so yeah for a person who is uh, being, who is watching football for league football for the first time it was like me that they can never lose so in the next season when they lost to a very small team i don't remember the name i was pretty surprised how can they lose when when they wins everything how can they lose so that was a very uh, innocent type of supporting those days but i think that that, uh, that dmu glory glory manchester united got clearly etched in my mind and uh, so that is when i started supporting and for the early for one or two years when i was uh, watching it was only united then i think arsenal came and gave a gave a uh, uh. strong and then chelsea happened but every time there was chelsea versus united then it was uh, first of all arsenal versus united then it was chelsea versus united then came city versus united it continued to 2013 so now uh, since 2013 it's a very hard time for me but yeah the support has uh, is now completely into my nerves so when united wins i feel uh, the, the, there is a mood factor which is now involved in united's game and i follow every damn game of united exactly uh, it was the invincibility of united that draw you uh, draw you in drew you into football but absolutely it, uh, arsenal stole the show a year later yeah uh, year later absolutely but i think that historic treble uh, still stand as a uh, as something which was stand out performance so it is a very tough nut to crack but definitely i i don't think any record is permanent definitely some day it will be broken or matched at least but still now it is it is a big big thing to achieve and that also i got to see in the very first season so my expectation on united will always remain sky high okay wait so, so, so i'll i'll go for the next uh, question i think uh, uh, i think Uh, we are done with but now i'll ask you some um, direct football related questions uh, so uh, what i want to ask you is now it's almost you tell you uh, started watching from 94 so at least uh, been uh, 2.5 decades uh, you have been watching the if i'm not wrong 
So what I need to know from you is what changes have you seen in this game? Because this game is continuously evolving with time. A lot of things which were prevalent those days are not prevalent now. Or a different thing, different uh, things are coming into the game. Different things are being removed from the game. So what exactly the changes, gradual changes you saw down the line uh, in this game? Well, to point out changes in the game, I would like to point out three specific areas. The first being uh, te- the use of technology without a doubt. The introduction of goal line technology and VAR. Uh, that has changed the game for good or bad that only time can tell. But uh, I believe that it was great. It saved a lot of heartbreaks probably. But it also took away the element of surprise from the game. Uh, the second thing I would like to mention is about the physicality of the game. Players are much more much more fit these days. And uh, the game in our childhood was very physical. The defenders used to get benefit of doubt in 50% of the cases at least. There was less penalties. And there was less, uh, more amount of red cards too. And these days, we do see penalties every weekend. I remember in my childhood, I hardly, I, I used to wait to see a penalty in a game. And lastly, I would like to say that the offside rule. The offside rule previously was that any player of the opposition behind the line of defence and it would be ruled offside in the favour of the defending team but it changed to being a player being involved in the game rather than just being in the offside half. So these are the three main things that I feel that changed in football. What about you, Mayu? Hi. So, hi. Yeah. Yeah, so what I was saying is uh, regarding the gradual changes, one thing uh, the technology, uh, the technology, and what you said is correct. But I think the re- old school football is something missing in the current play. Most of the time, I would see due to excess matches being played. I think most of the teams are turning out to be very tactical about uh, tactical about which uh, how they want to build a team and uh, they are going defensive, going attacking. Something. Uh, I think that is something uh, we, we just changed a lot because a lot of tactics that if in every World Cup we see tactics like uh, this thing uh, some some get and pressing or sometime uh, see tactics like box nine and tiki taka. Exactly, Mike. There has been a, there has been an evolution of ta- tactics and uh, I mean implementation of science at every level probably that you are talking about oh, yeah, otherwise this power the shift of power the the, the, yeah the shift yes. of power from the old powerhouses to newer teams uh, like Leicester showed us in 2016 they had a very old school 442 and still managed to garner counter attacks uh, which from which Mares and Vadi ripped benefits, and uh, exactly what you're st- saying. Yeah, and also uh, I think uh, the, this thing, the, uh, what you are saying, this old school attacking football first uh, Dortmund started. I think Dortmund started it way back uh, under Klopp, and uh, somehow from bottom uh, bottom half, uh, suddenly we saw Dortmund came up and just uh, sc- did numbers. So uh, that is when we saw this uh, because whenever I see that old school attacking football is coming, it is adding a whole new flair into the game, and somehow uh, I see a lot of positivity in in that strategy. But however, yes, that uh, is a, a so the bunch game. of changes. I feel that that you specifically, as you mentioned, uh, Jargon Klopp, uh, he started this in Mines. That was way back in two thousand eight. And Mainz perf- uh, performed too well for the German second division, and they got promoted. And th- that's how Mainz is also his home club. He played for Mainz, exactly. and he's a he's a local yeah. boy there. Yeah, and then he came up to the big league of uh, Dortmund uh, and Bayern Munich. That rivalry between Guardiola and Klopp back oh, yeah. then. 
which ended and, with a only, only manager who has uh, who uh, managed to beat Guardiola uh, for the most number of times. So I think Guardiola has some kind of problem playing against him, be it any club. Yeah, everyone has their worst nightmares. Yeah, and he uh, just on a lighter note, he uh, uh, got Mourinho thrown out of his job twice. Yeah, <laughs> he did it for Chelsea. He did it when Mourinho was in Chelsea, and he did it when Mourinho was in United. So in both, both situations, absolutely. I think Klopp was better to blame. He is absolutely not the special one for the special one. Absolutely, yeah. That, that that is that is the thing because whenever Guardiola claims to be uh, the invincible, I think there is there is always a Klopp. So so I think this uh, big spending. Uh, for big spending clubs, you always have a Guardiola. But for uh, for for not so big spending clubs, I think people who want to play football with all their passion and with their hearts, I, th- I think Klopp is an ideal manager for them. What do you think? Well, his pol- political background helps him, I guess, in identifying yeah. talents and harnessing talents. <laughs> Absolutely, so he has a lot to do, and and he is very clear about it that his footballing and political ideology is somehow the same. Exactly. Okay, so talking about. So uh, now, now you mentioned about uh, this thing. You mentioned about the usage of technology. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely, we saw what happened to Frank Lampard in uh, in the World Cup. And that was shocking. I think that for yeah. that you don't even need technology. To be very honest, uh, that that was absolutely a shocking decision at a shocking point. Uh, even I do believe the result could have been different. But considering the strength of Germany and England, I don't think much uh, difference have been there. But still, uh, do you think that margin of error is no more than that controversy, that controversy creation? Due to which people used to fight, and those controversies actually helps a game to, uh, which because as more controversy doesn't always mean something bad. Controversy is about fighting about something, some decision, some point, and that somehow contributes to uh, 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 how popular the game will. Be. Uh, so, what do you think this uh, excess use of technology has come into play? So, this has uh, probably this has mechanized the whole procedure, I guess. What you are trying to point out is that it has mechanized it to an extent where the where you feel probably it's uh, harming the emotional quotient of the game. Uh, maybe you are true. Only time will tell. Yeah, but we'll definitely, like Frank Lampard, I absolutely have. Uh, uh, I am also on the, their side because they had to lose in a World Cup match because of the lack of technology. So that that factor also has to be considered. And considering what I am seeing and what England had to go through in that uh, World Cup, I think uh, I think uh, yeah, uh, technology is yeah, the result. I guess at the end of the day, absolutely. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, actually, we discussed a lot of points. So uh, that sums up our first episode very much. So, uh, anyways, we uh, will be back with our consequent episodes uh, with our different set of football fans uh, uh, from different geographical areas. And uh, I think Sorko, you want to say something? Yeah, you summed it up perfectly. And yeah, we'll see all of you again. Uh, till then, goodbye from my side. Yeah, and goodbye from my side too. Uh, Stay safe during this uh, critical lockdown period. Thank you so much. Thank you.